water. It's all around us. So much so we almost don't even see it. But it shapes our lives in ever so many ways. The many raindrops that fall merge to form lakes, ponds, and brooks that in turn merge to form a stream. A stream with the power to let us build our community. We see the Stony Brook watershed occupies an area of 51 square miles and includes brooks, ponds, and lakes in seven other towns besides Chelmsford. These towns include Ayr, Boxborough, Harvard, Groton, Littleton, Tingsboro, and Westford. The watershed has one of its primary headwaters in Boxborough at Wolf Swamp. This is the start of Beaver Brook. Other key streams such as Bennett's Brook and Keys Brook merge to form the Stony Brook. Although the Stony Brook looks like a typical, small, unassuming New England brook as it flows through Chelmsford, it has played a major role in making our area what it is today. In turn, we have made the Stony Brook what it is today by building retaining walls, dams, and bridges along its banks. Hi, my name is Alan Beebe. I'm a volunteer member of Chelmsford Telemedia. I'm your host for this trip down the Stony Brook. Our journey will be a lesson on the interaction of two histories, our history and natural history. You'll see how our past activities and an ecological process called natural succession have made the Stony Brook we see today. From this, we can speculate on the brook's future. Through a series of separate episodes, we'll move along the Stony Brook towards its confluence with the Merrimack River. I'm in the Adams Library looking at the book History of Chelmsford by Reverend Wilson Waters, who completed the work started by Henry Spaulding Parham, who had passed away. Reverend Waters notes that in 1830, Stony Brook was dammed to create an impoundment for a mill site that was used by the Chelmsford Company. This mill site became Chelmsford Woolen Mills with a main building called Eagle Mills. In 1863, a fire destroyed the Eagle Mills building, which was rebuilt as shown in this plate from the history of Chelmsford. A map created in 1875 of West Chelmsford provides a view of the impoundment and the mill site using the Stony Brook for power. Looking at a portion of a later map from 1889, we see an outlet stream emerging from the Eagle Mills. A control gate in the dam shown here allowed the mill operators to control the flow into the building. In the following set of photographs taken at various times from different views of the impoundment through the years show it as a large open water area essentially free of any aquatic vegetation. In this photo taken prior to 1908, we see the open water of the impoundment as seen along the railroad tracks. In the background we see the ruins of the Eagle Mills building destroyed by fire in December 1883, along with the Sudgen Press Bagging Building and a train. As an interesting aside, a brakeman is sitting on top of one of the rail cars. In this photo, we get a different view of the large expanse of open water. The photo was maybe taken sometime in 1918, showing the Sugden Press Bagging Building and the William C. Edwards Farm in the background. Notice the roof of the Sugden Press Bagging Building. It provides a clue to our timeline for the impoundment. In this photo taken after 1920, 
and likely before 1979 from approximately the same location, we can see the Sugden Press Bagging Building now has a flat roof. In fact, the entire building has been renovated and we can see a portion of the West Chelmsford Water Tower. These provide a clue as to the timeline. Poundland still has open water. Even into the 1970s, open water remained with patches of lily pads present as seen in this photo showing the West Chelmsford Water Tower before it was removed in 1979. We can see that the impoundment was still an open water area with little or no eutrophication. The filling in of emergent plant growth for over a hundred years. If we look closely, we can see a small boat beached on the shore of the dam very close to the location of the former Eagle Mills building. The impoundment likely provided a recreational resource for fishing and indeed for ice skating in the winter, as seen in these photos of hockey players and a crowd of people gathered to possibly watch a hockey game sometime in the 1920s. The Sugden Press Bagging Building is in the background. Now, as seen here in this view from a drone, you can see the impoundment is filling in with plants that are spreading throughout the impoundment, and a tree line has developed along the railroad tracks. By August of 2022, we see areas of lush plant growth in this view looking at the mill from the edge of the impoundment along the tracks. A thick stand of an invasive plant, purple loosestrife, dominates the vegetation across the way. Only during a high water flow period, such as in the spring or after a very large rain event, will water cover all the plants. Eventually, this area will be a swampy meadow, with the stream meandering through it. Returning to the 1875 map of West Chelmsford, we'll take a closer look at the dam spillway and the stretch of the brook just upstream from the School Street Bridge. The dam that creates the impoundment is a complex structure consisting of large granite blocks with a space for the control gate that we looked at earlier and the main spillway we see here in this photo showing the railroad freight building, the Sugden Press bagging building, part of the West Chelmsford Rail Station, all framing the dam spillway during a period of high stream flow. This photo provides a closer look at the spillway with its staircase construction. During this time, a small bridge enabled crossing over the spillway and enabled access to remove any debris that may have lodged in the spillway. In this video from 1993, we can see the spillway during a period of low flow the building has changed and the small bridge has been removed. The right-hand bank looks like it's overgrown and in need of repair. This location offers an attractive historic site for further development and use. Now, along with other renovations for this mill site, now called Eagle Mill, 11 School Street, the dam has been landscaped. Downstream from the dam is a beautiful series of pools and riffles flowing over a cobble bottom caused by scouring during high water flows. Here the brook takes on what must have been its true appearance before the dam was built with water flowing over a rocky and sandy bottom. A large tree has fallen into the stream just upstream from the School Street Bridge, causing a slowing of the current. While we don't know when or how this blowdown occurred, it is likely due to high winds and some erosion around the tree on the steep banks of the stream in this location. According to an August 2022 article, Wood is Good, 
by the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, downed trees and limbs that fall into water bodies provide countless benefits to fish and the entire aquatic ecosystem. They provide new habitats for aquatic invertebrates and cover for fish. However, with this particular fallen tree, it slows the stream flow enough to allow several plants of an invasive species, European water chestnut, trapanatans, to grow in a calm area by the tree. This emergent plant has a cluster of leaves with air chambers, enabling the plant to float on the surface that we see here. The plant has a single root strand that extends up from the stream bottom to hold the plant in place. Here we can see that there are several root strands extending to the surface for several individual plants that are growing next to each other. In calm open water areas, water chestnut plants can form a dense mat, like the mats we can see here in the Eagle Mill impoundment. These mat clusters will spread throughout the impoundment and eventually cover much of the impoundment. These dense mats crowd out other floating plants such as lily pads and block sunlight penetration to the bottom. Each individual plant can produce several nut-like seeds. The water chestnut seeds have spikes that allow them to be attached to waterfowl or other aquatic animals enabling a way to spread water chestnut plants. In addition, plants that break off from the root strand can wash downstream, further enabling the spread of water chestnut in Stony Brook. The seeds sink to the bottom and can remain viable for at least 12 years. The spikes are sharp enough to puncture a boot or injure a person's foot if the seed is stepped on while wading in shallow water. Just below the blowdown, the Stony Brook flows under the School Street Bridge. This two-arch stone bridge was built in 1850, two years after the completion of the Stony Brook Railroad Line between Ayr and North Chelmsford. Along with the railroad track, the construction of School Street and its bridge, it furthered the growth of West Chelmsford Village. High flow periods through this section certainly can erode the steep banks of the stream and impact the bridge embankment. Observation of the bridge embankment areas need to be conducted at regular intervals. This maintenance issue and additional work on the bridge has been addressed at an April 2023 town meeting. In addition, town meeting provided funding to move the freight house to the garrison house property, thus enabling the preservation of some of West Chelmsford's railroad history. Before we move further downstream, we'll look at an area adjacent to the School Street Bridge, School Street, and the railroad tracks that has an influence on the stream as highlighted here using the 1875 West Chelmsford map. The map shows a small pond-like area next to the tracks. In this photo taken in the late 1880s, we see School Street, a train approaching the West Chelmsford Depot and the Eagle Mill ruins in the background. In the foreground of the photo, we see the large pool of water next to the railroad tracks. In this photo, also from the same time period, perhaps taken later in the same year since there are no leaves on the trees, and prior to 1908, we see a slightly different view showing more of School Street, the Subden Press bagging building, the freight house, the West Chelmsford Depot, and the Eagle Mill ruins in the background. In the foreground of the photo, we see the pool of water next to the railroad tracks. In his book, Images of America, North and West Chelmsford, Fred Merriam notes the section of School Street in the photo was constantly in need of repairs from washouts and was dangerous for pedestrians. 
In the photo, we can see the eroded embankment and remains of previous repair work that failed to stabilize the area. The water level in the pool is also much lower than it was in the previous photo. In this photo, taken sometime after January 1908, we see that that section of School Street has been rebuilt with a stone retaining wall and a small culvert enabling drainage into the pool by the tracks. Again, in his book, Images of America, North and West Chelmsford, Fred Merriam notes that William C. Edwards, the owner of the farm property next to School Street and the railroad tracks, along with 20 other people donated labor or material for the road work project. Since we can no longer see the Eagle Mill ruins in the photo, Mr. Merriam's that the stones from the ruins may have been used to build the retaining wall. In this photo taken in February 2023, we can see the retaining wall remains while the pool area is nearly dry after the summer drought 2022. The pool area is fed by a small brook paralleling School Street and emptying into the pool area, which may have been part of the Stony Brook. When the rail bed was built, part of the area was filled with earth to create the level rail bed. To enable the drainage of the pool, it has a drain pipe shown in this photo. The drain pipe opening is currently clogged by a tire and other debris. The drain pipe passes under the tracks and the rail bed embankment and empties into the Stony Brook just downstream from the School Street Bridge, as we can see in this July 2022 video. Continuing downstream, we move into another mill site of historical significance to Chelmsford, especially West Chelmsford, the Farwell Factory Roby Mill site. For a time in the mid-1990s, a sign denoting the site was mounted on a pole along School Street next to the railroad tracks in Stony Brook. Unfortunately, the sign is no longer there and was likely stolen. Looking at this photo taken prior to 1900, we see a view of this mill site looking downstream from School Street that people would have seen for many years from the 1850s through the very early 1900s. Reverend Waters provides details about the early development of this location in this history of Chelmsford. Deacon John Farwell, originally from Fitchburg, purchased land and water rights to establish and build a scythe factory on the Stony Brook sometime after 1820. You can see a display of scythes at the Chelmsford Historical Society Museum. The 1831 map of Chelmsford shows the Scythe Factory location. For a time, the village was known as Farwell Village or Scythe Factory Village prior to the building of the rail line. Eventually, the mill business changed ownership as we can see here in this portion of the 1856 map of North Chelmsford and West Chelmsford. When preparing my earlier Stony Brook video project in the mid-1990s, I had the opportunity to interview Bernie Reddy, a Chelmsford resident who has studied the mill site and its former owner to learn more about this Chelmsford mill location. My name is Christopher Roby, okay? And I came from Tingsboro. His family had a farm in Tingsboro. In about 1850, he bought into a uh, scathe factory, um, made farm utensils, this kind of thing. Uh, he bought into it in West Chelmsford with a man I believe named Sawyer. And so they went into business together. And eventually Christopher Roby bought out Sawyer. Now, uh, before the Civil War they made all kinds of farm instruments there. And, but their biggest customers were the, were the southern states. And when the Civil War broke out, uh, everything he had shipped down to the south 
they just didn't pay him for him. So he was very much behind the eight ball right off the bat with his company. But uh, he found manufacturing swords for the Union really pulled his company out. Um, he manufactured thousands of swords. I can show you some. This right here is a cavalry saber that uh, he manufactured for the Union. And you can see it's a cavalry. Right on the handle here, it says uh, United States. Uh, 1864, and then the other side it actually says Christopher Roby, uh, West Chelsea, Massachusetts. According to uh, Andy Wilson, who is the current owner of the property, uh, it was over an acre and a half of buildings, a factory, at one time in its, at its height. So I guess it was quite a prosperous place. If you go there and you look at the ruins, you see uh, huge granite walls with big openings going to the railroad track. So it must have must have been quite a few people. I know Fred Burns. Uh, when he was a little boy, lived in the Roby house. And he used to talk to the men who were quite old at that time, who used to make the handles for Roby and this kind of stuff. So he actually talked to people who worked there. There were a lot of workers in West Chelmsford. That street in West Chelmsford, his house is still there. And all of his managers are there. Like you'll see names on them. For about four house, four or five houses down, they have names on them. Those were the people who worked in his factory. Those were his managers and, and uh, big wheels. Right, Main Street. So that factory basically was the reason that, that West Chelmsford was there. Uh, Roby got a, uh, eventually called West Chelmsford with the man who had the Eagle Factory. They got together and they called it, it used to be called Scaife Village. And um, I think Fowell began the factory there and it was called Fowell's uh, Village and this kind of stuff. And finally, they, between these two mills, they got to call West Chelmsford. You can see a display of Roby swords at the Chelmsford Historical Society Museum. After the Roby Manufacturing Company ceased operation in 1875, the site was purchased by the Hiscock File Company. As we can see in this photo of the company's letterhead, it manufactured a wide variety of products. Looking at the 1875 West Chelmsford map, we see this mill site had a significant impoundment and had a channel that provided water to power two steam turbines. This drawing of the mill complex, which was on the Hiscock File Company's letterhead, shows the buildings as seen from Main Street in West Chelmsford. The impoundment formed by this site's dam on the Stony Brook is on the right side of the drawing. This photo of the site, taken most likely during the winter of 1899, shows some interesting natural history in addition to the history about the mill site. This historical timeline and map from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Integrated Drought Information System website shows there was an extreme drought during the winter of 1899 in Middlesex County. We can see in the photo that there are no leaves on the trees and a patch of snow near the railroad tracks. The mill impoundment is nearly completely dry, showing a muddy bottom with a significant sediment buildup along the right shoreline, an indication that the stream channel is undergoing changes. The Hiscock file company stopped operating in 1889. In 1893, the mill site property was purchased by George C. Moore for water rights along the Stony Brook. George C. Moore was a prominent businessman and mill owner who brought extensive development to the area. He used the building on the left as a stable and a storage area for hay. The building on the right side of the photo was torn down sometime in 1900. This photo, taken on September 11, 1902, shows the mill building and its nearby office building on fire. Both buildings were destroyed. We can also see that the impoundment created by the mill site dam is filled with water from shoreline to shoreline across Stony Brook, right up to the railroad embankment. In this photo, taken about three years later, 
we see the Millside Dam, part of its impoundment and part of the original stone foundation with plans to build a new wool processing facility on the site. George Moore replaced the stone foundation with concrete. However, that facility was not built and eventually the dam was removed. Concrete and stone foundations are the only items left on the site and in the Stony Brook today, as we see here. Stony Brook changed as well. With the removal of the dam, the stream channel developed a steady flow bending towards the left side of this former impoundment area. The area adjacent to the railroad embankment is now a flat, dry land area covered with areas of dense brush and trees. With the increased current, a cobble bottom emerged providing a renewed underwater habitat for aquatic life such as crayfish like the one we see here. To summarize, we've seen that the Stony Brook provided the locations for two prosperous mill sites, which along with the arrival of the railway line enabled the development of the West Chelmsford Village with its cluster of homes along Main Street and School Street, as we can see here in this mass GIS map of inventoried historic properties in West Chelmsford. The railway development included a station house, for passenger service and a freight house. Fires were an ongoing threat during these times and ultimately fire destroyed the main Eagle Mill structure and all the Roby Hiscock buildings. At the Eagle Mill location, the remaining building passed through several owners and uses and is still in use today, providing office space and a wellness spa. The railway station house was torn down and the freight house will be moved from its current location to the historic Garrison House property, thus prefer preserving some of the West Chelmsford Railroad history. Both mill sites had dams that created open water impoundments in Stony Brook, upstream of each mill location. These provided water power to the mills. Upstream from the Eagle Mill location, we can see the changes to the impoundment caused by the dam slowing the flow of water and changing the brook's main channel. The railroad culverts, often called tubes, create a 90 degree bend in the brook and oxbows where the stream bends back and forth through the impoundment to the dam spillway. In addition, emergent plant growth has been filling in the area. The remaining open water is filling in with the invasive European water chestnut plant. Eventually, the Stony Brook will be a narrow winding channel passing through a swampy meadow. At the Roby Hiscock mill site, the removal of the dam created a fast flowing section of the brook with a cobble bottom with substantial aeration beneficial to aquatic life in the brook. Below the mill site, the stream flows into another small impoundment that will be the starting point of our next episode, the Canal and Freeman Lake.